Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Please come in and join and scoot a little closer. It's a big room and we want to fill it up. Um, I want to introduce the panel to you. We're going to talk about activist investing, and that has certainly gotten a lot of attention lately and a lot of uh, media attention. Uh, we don't have uh, Bill Ackman or Carl Icahn on the panel, so we're going to take their name in vain and probably talk a little bit about them. Um, but I think we what's important to. is to help you understand that activist investing is not just those two people. It's a lot more than that. And in fact, it is an opportunity to improve companies in America. We find too often that companies are underperform and don't do as well. So my name is Chris Elman. I'm the Chief Investment Officer from the California State Teachers Retirement System, CalSTRS. We have 180 billion. So we're long-term owners. We typically own a company for 30 years. We care about not just next quarter's earnings, but the next 20 years. So with me this afternoon, these gentlemen are going to talk about what they do to try and improve companies, and particularly, what in the world is activist investing? So first off, Cliff, I'm going to kick it to you. What's the difference between you guys and Bill Ackman and Carl Icahn and Dan Loeb? Well, activists come in all different shapes and styles, and everyone has a different approach. Uh, and, uh, and those uh, gentlemen you, uh, you mentioned are, are known to all of us in the panel, and they're very accomplished investors. From Blue Harbor's standpoint, which is our firm, it's really the, a completely different style. Uh, we've been doing this for 10 years exclusively on a friendly basis. We only back management teams that we like and who sort of welcome us as lead stockholders. Uh, but it doesn't mean our approach is better, it just means our approach is different. Uh, I, I've come for 20 years in the private equity business from uh, KKR and General Atlantic, and my strategy is to partner with companies and back only those management teams that want to be in business with us. So activism, is, you know, it's, it's big, it's broad, it's done in, de in many different ways, but our approach would be quite different than, than those that you, you mentioned. Uh, but I'm not making a value judgment about it. You know, sometimes we meet a company and the board is horrible and the CEO is horrible. We won't invest in it and some more aggressive activists should uh, assert for stockholder rights. But our approach to Blue Harbor would be quite different than uh, those that you mentioned. Can we divide the industry into white hats and black hats? Is, that, is it that clear? You know, it's really a continuum, I think. And I think even the gentleman that you mentioned would like to find companies, speaking for them, where they could actually align their interests. I, I think, the can, I, can, I, can we interrupt too? Yeah. You bet, yeah, I jump think, in. You know, I think the white hat, black hat thing is, you know, that's um, fine. Um, I would define the black hat as the activist investor whose first call uh, with an agenda is to the media and second call is to the CEO. And I think that uh, even those guys you mentioned have tried not to do that. Um, but I think their inclination and their temperament is to do it that way. And I find that um, very black hat-like because you don't even try to really engage with the company. You're trying to set a public agenda that has more or less a short-term goal, in my opinion. They try, some of these guys tried to go on boards, and you notice they couldn't stay. So uh, this is what they do, and I think it is a black hat. If it makes is sense. that helpful to the industry? Does that actually hurt it? You know, um, I'm, I'm usually when I'm on these panels with Carl or Dan, I'm, I'm, I'm actually the nice guy. <laughs> on, the, on this panel, I, I see all these friendly activists, and I'm actually the, the mean guy today. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a, a good or bad. I mean, everybody's got their own approach, um, and uh, you know, f for me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be friendly as long as the company does what I want them to do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, like how that kind of defines, that, that defines our, how, our relationship with the manager. And, uh, um, you know, and, and the good news is actually companies don't seem to want to tangle with us anymore. It's getting a little boring. We've, we've, I think about the last seven deals we did, and uh, we just showed up, t took a position. I called the CEO. I always call, I, I, to your point, I think you make a good point, distinction, Jeff. Um, I always call the CEO f privately first. Right. And I, try, and I try and meet with them before we're ever public. And, um, you know, if I think about these last seven deals, every single time I called the CEO, 
met with them, laid out what I thought they needed to do, and they just did it. You know, they, 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 didn't, they didn't really want to fight. So I think it's a good evolution. Yeah, so I, think, our, I think it's, it's, it's certainly, at Red Mountain, we focus on smaller companies, and uh, we take a constructive approach. Uh, but it's all about are you adding long-term value and how you do that. And there's uh, different situations require different approaches. Uh, we try to take a constructive approach. And I would agree that uh, I think advisors and management teams and boards, even of smaller companies, uh, have a more nuanced view of activism or, and recognize that we're shareholders looking to enhance value. And, and, uh, and so they're much more willing to listen and to, uh, and to engage. So when... Bill or uh, Carl goes to Twitter and announces an activism campaign. Is that making it easier for you to get CEO's attention, or are they suddenly putting up a wall and trying to block you? To make I, you I think up? that there's been a palpable change in the last four or five years, generally, in the attitudes of boards and CEOs and their willingness to listen to large stockholders. I think it sort of started with the financial crisis. I think that most corporate directors realized that the root cause of the crisis itself was poor corporate oversight of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and AIG and the investment banks and large state plans like CalSTRS and other thought leaders have gone to Washington and changed the rules on broker voting and proxy access. I think generally there's just been an awakening of stockholder rights and boards are just more willing to listen. They're certainly willing to listen to the folks in this panel and people who have constructive ideas. And in generalizing, but many of them are understanding they're going to listen to their large hold holders, even the hostile guys. So I think that there's just been, and I think this is a good thing, and I, I think there's just generally been an awakening of stockholder rights. That, 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 being, also, that being said, though, the, the, um, the, you know, the fact that, that activist investing is day trader fodder is bad. And, and the fact that is, is bad. What is? The, the media. The fact that, that, that activist activity is day trader fodder, oh. that is bad. And, the, and Carl tweeting is not helpful. I mean, you know, I looked at, uh, I, looked at I reviewed eBay. We, we own eBay at 50. We like the strategy of keeping them together as long as possible while you're playing this zero-sum game in the payment business. Um, and we were ready to buy more on on, on the investment uh, uh, that he was going to do on the last quarter, where he took both EBIT down in 14, 15, and 16, because we're long-term guys. And in, uh, on the news, the company actually jumped Carl and disclosed his position. And the stock has basically separated itself from the fundamentals. And then we review what actually happened. And after all of this, the uh, outcome is that Carl had uh, 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 David Dorman put on the board. Now, David, we know David. He's on the Motorola Solutions board with us. He's a fine director, but there's no, that's kind of no change. Right. It's unched. You know, but the, just just you see all the activity in the media about this. It's an unched situation. Well, Sony's and the list. stocks actually are separating from fundamentals on the back of news that is not uh, not change change making. I think that's that's a problem a little bit. You're, you're, you're what you're going you're going to the the issue of what's a good target and what isn't. And, you know, I mean, eBay, as brilliant as Carl is, I mean, that, that wasn't a good target. He wasn't going to win a proxy fight, so he had no recourse if they didn't want to do it. And that's why, you know, he did this kind of milk toast, uh, you know, uh, You know, yeah, he's a good stock picker, and so I think maybe there's just a recognition that by the retail trade that yeah. they want to follow him as a stock picker. But the activist activity there was a non-event. Right. I, yeah, I, mean, I agree. Yeah. Um, you know, to your point, uh, Cliff, about um, uh, boards and management's re response to an activist, um, I agree. I mean, it's just, it's like world of difference today. Ten years ago, we'd show up at a company and they would put in a pill, put in a staggered board, sue us call the SEC, call the Justice Department, you know, change their bylaws. I mean, every, everything they could. And today, you don't get any of that, none of it, because they've come to realize that, you know, all they're doing is hanging themselves. They're alienating the shareholder base, and um, the shareholders are smart, smart and they realize that uh, if tactics are all they can hang their hat on, then they, they realize that they can't win the argument on, on ideas. Mm -hmm. So... I think it's a very welcome 
welcome. Uh, it's also, uh, I think, if you can demonstrate that you're willing to take a long-term approach and then have a demonstrated track record of actually uh, enhancing value for all shareholders, it's about uh, you know, reputational equity. It's something that um, now that you know, Red Mountain's been in the business for some eight or nine years, we can actually go to a management team, have a conversation with the management team and the board and say, we can tell you how great Red Mountain is, but here's a list of every management team and board that we've worked with, call them up. And, and sometimes the relationships, you know, they get, we gotta make tough decisions. But ultimately, if you take a long-term approach and really can demonstrate that you're enhancing value, uh, you should be well received. Well, and Chris, you cover small cap stocks. Correct. What happens in the few cases that management doesn't follow through? What do you do? Well, typically what we, if we see any sort of um, insecurity or defensiveness from a management team at our initial meeting, we'll typically just back off and, and walk away. Now with that said, you know, life's too short. We're, we're looking at a broad universe of companies with market caps of sub $2 billion. And so we've got a, you know, and we're running a concentrated portfolio of 10 to 15 names. So we've got time and... Um, but if we, you build up a 3 4% position yes. and then meet with management and they say no, you'll back well, out. Well, we typically that. are at 1% to 2%, okay. and so it, it is about how much capital you've actually allocated to the situation. But, uh, but the, having said that, you know, if we join a board, uh, you're going to have, it's, it's tough to not have really difficult uh, conversations with these small cap companies. They're typically, in many instances, the CEO looks more like a COO, the CFO looks more like a controller. And the board is typically not necessarily a group of bad actors, but complacent and limits public company board experience. And so uh, in order to truly enhance value, uh, oftentimes there's tough decisions that uh, require change. And, um, and, uh, and so you've got you to be willing to really um, uh, you know, have those tough conversations, be able to uh, demonstrate that it is uh, value enhancing. And if you can do that, you typically can, can uh, operate through consensus. Yeah, well, I, I, go, I go the opposite direction. When, yeah. when, the, when I sense that management is not forthcoming, I go deeper into it. I buy more of it, and I, and I, make, I make them do what they should be doing. How, me, how do you do that? that? Well, you know, when you, if, you have, if you can win the, the debate on ideas mm -hmm. and on yeah. value creation, and you have shareholder support, you know, I, I basically pose the, 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 the alternatives to the management. I say, you can, you can take our ideas, make them your own. You can, you can um, uh, implement those ideas, take all the credit. You can be the agent of change. No, you don't let them take credit. I do. You do not. I, I, I'll give you an example. No I, way. I give, um, no. That's anyway. fine. That's fine. Uh, but don't, just, you don't. keep quiet. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and then I say, you know, the alternative is you could fight me. And then um, you're going to be dragged through a very difficult public campaign. And you're going to end up making the same changes anyway and be viewed as very weak and having been dragged to the finish line. So, you know, take your choice. But uh, Maybe, no, we, maybe we, let me take credit on the ones we, where you don't we, have to go into proxy mode. Maybe you do that then, yeah. Yeah, but you know what? We've done 60 of them and we only had one proxy. All right. Because, you know what? They... I got in trouble last year for saying every once in a while you have to whack, a, whack somebody for them to realize you're willing to... Uh, you know, the thing about, activist, the thing about it is, is um, I mean, it does deserve to be an asset class. There's a, you know, there's a huge role that, that we're playing in bringing a shareholder mentality to the boardroom. It's still too short term. I'm telling you, it's too short term. So when, uh, when you can uh, get involved in a high quality business, and you can get yourself on a board uh, with, a, with a management team that you trust, and you're driving the capital allocation process, um, you have the opportunity to eliminate reinvestment risk and not try to find the next new activist play, but to build the company, right? So we've had five in investments that have gone eight years plus, and these are 20% IRRs over eight years, so there's a lot of money in that, and it's a very low risk way to build a business. I just, I just think whenever you have to go public uh, and you get on this board and it's about spinning this off or, or buying that or buying your shares back or what have you, you kind of sit there and you, you take your one year or two year winnings and you go. And that you're going at the very time the management is actually listening to you. So why not stay with it, you know? And, and, and that's, that's what I would, where I'd push back on the whole industry. 
Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. There's a perception out there that, that activism is a short-term strategy, and maybe for some activists it is, but I've been investing for my whole career. There's no quick fixes in, in life. There's no quick money to be made. Uh, if you have an idea to help a company create value, that takes time. And, uh, and I think that, uh, like speaking for myself, and I think those in the panel, that's the way we invest. And, you know, there are, there are no, there's no quick fixes in life, and so uh, it takes time to, to, to create value in companies. Can I? Can I uh, you can. You can disagree. I take the opposite side of that. Um, uh, I'd like nothing better than to have a long-term investment and not have to do anything for eight years. And no, you're doing a lot, yeah, you're man. Doing you're a lot, in the room. I mean, you're doing that, stuff. That's great. I, I, I'd be happy to. But, you know, the changes that we'll implement oftentimes are, are changes that have, do have an immediate impact and a long-term benefit to the company. I mean, take, you know, spinning off a business that's a non-core business that's, that's definitionally a lower multiple business and is a drag on, on investment in the, you know, a core business is, will have a short-term immediate impact on the stock and a long-term benefit to the company. So I, I don't think they're inconsistent. Yeah, I think one of the things, again, about small cap companies is, and why we like them so much, is there's so much low-hanging fruit. And so our toolkit spans, you know, capital allocation, uh, financial optimization, strategic, operational, governance. There's so much opportunity. Uh, so uh, to Cliff's point, uh, at least in our world, I mean, we have uh, multiple investments where we've been invested um, uh, in excess of five years. And, uh, and we have seen a build of value in each one of those uh, in each one of those uh, buckets, and so um, I'd say we're we're we're, we're like-minded thinkers in the context of in order to truly build sustainable intrinsic value. I think it does take time, especially in the small cap space where there's so much. Also, if I think that if an activist gets involved with the company and changes the attitude of the board and the management in the way they think think like an owner and make the right decisions and start working for stockholders. Even after that, that activist leaves, whether it's after two years or three years or four years, that, that company's changed and their attitude has changed and they've learned a bunch of stuff and there could be and should be longer term benefits for that company even after the activist might change. Well, that's what, that's what Barry says and I think that there's studies that su support that actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's right. I do think though that I'm trying to change the whole mentality of the players, you know, when, when you get, um, Corvex Capital going on the ADT board, asking management to lever up, and they do, asking to go on the board, and they say yes. And within a year, you, you sell all your shares back in the middle of the night to the company at the last tick. You grab a $33 to $43 move. You're gone. And within 45 days, they miss the quarter, and they're over leveraged and distressed. And their credibility is now damaged. That is. Uh, uh, th my point is the management team is working. Of course, with that makes you. us all look better. Well, that's right. <laughs> I guess it does. I, I guess it does. But um, but you know, in in the vernacular of the media, yeah. it's a win. You know, the uh, activist triumphs. It's a loss. The company's worse off. So you, you you know you just have to. We have to be more balanced than how we talk about this stuff because there's some real failures out there. And, th and that should allow companies, frankly, to push back some, because I think they're rolling over a little too easy, actually, right now, to everybody. So. And I, I think that's one of the risks of, with, with activism, just generally uh, you know, seeing the tail or experiencing the tailwinds that it, that it currently is, you are going to bring in um, uh, actors who might not necessarily have the expertise that uh, folks who have been doing it for you know, nine, ten years plus uh, have. There's no barrier to entry. So. NACD, uh, the National Association of Corporate Directors, put out a paper for its director membership that they think there's about 13 firms in your space doing this. Some are hedge funds, long, short, so some have a short time frame. There's no barrier to entry. What's to stop other people from coming in? Wait, they said there's 13 activist firms? Yep. Yeah. Well, well, I don't know where they're getting their data from. There's like 150, I think. It, here's there the are. Deal. I mean, it, there's just there's been a proliferation of a lot of activists. I could probably take off 30 or 40 of off the top of my head. There are about 12 to 15 firms, though, including those represented here, who have scale capital, long-term records, institutional backing, you know, recommended by the consultants, been doing it for a long time, and there's been a lot of excess returns. So when there's excess returns, people come into the business. But this is not easy to do. It's just not about buying some stock and filing a 13D. I mean, 
It's a, first and foremost, it's investing. You need to be a good investor to do this. You need to have credibility. You need to have experience. You need to have the you know, board, board wanting to listen to you. I think you know, some of the new entrants will do well, not all of them. But I think you know, it, there's a reason why there's about a dozen firms that have you know, the, you know, the, the history, the record, and the scale of capital. And I think that um, others will come in, and some will do well, not all of them. But Barry's right. There's a lot of new people coming into the business. Uh, but this is not easy to do. It is not easy to find a company that's a great investment, that's undervalued, where you have an idea, convince the board to take your idea, and go in there and unlock the value. It's, it's not, you, you can't do that, just turn it up uh, and, and buy some stock. And, and, you, and you have to be willing to withstand uh, volatility. Uh, you've got to be willing, at least in our case, where we get on the board, uh, oftentimes making uh, decisions that are going to have a short-term impact, negative impact on the stock, but it ultimately is going to enhance the value over the long term. So. Uh, you've got to have the stomach for it as well. Barry, you've had, uh, you mentioned lots of positive examples. Can you give us an example of a successful engagement lately? Uh, okay. Um, recently, we had a very successful uh, investment in Safeway. And um, this was kind of textbook. I mean, this was a company. Is that because Cerberus bought it out? Well, that was a pretty good outcome. Um, but uh, that, that really, we, we always thought that was a possibility, but that really wasn't the, you know, the crux of the thesis. This is a company that, um, you know, had been an underperformer. Its, its margins were below its peers. It's traded at a, at a discount to all of its peers. And, um, but when we drilled down and really looked at what was going on, we saw that they were very strong in certain markets, like the Northern California, the Pacific Northwest, and, um, and then the rest of the country, they were pretty weak, particularly like Chicago and Texas. And if you stripped out those, those areas that they were weak in, and there's no real um, uh, economies of scale, it's a very local business. So it doesn't really matter whether you, you, you know, that you own stores in different markets. I mean, it's a market by market kind of business. And um, when you stripped out the, the, the money losing uh, locations like Chicago, uh, regions and, and, and or marginally profitable like Texas, you were left with a company actually that had the best margins in the industry, the best growth rate, and would trade ultimately at a much higher multiple. Um, so, you know, that was interesting to us. Um, and as a result, we advocated that they get out of some of these markets, either sell them or shut them down, and uh, sort of reposition the company. Then the company had some non-core assets, like they had a, 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 like a, a loyalty gift card business called uh, uh, Blackhawk, and which is, would, tr would trade independently at a much higher mul uh, multiple than the grocery business. And they had already taken a, a piece of it, they did a split off, took a piece of it public. And we, we argued that they should just spin off the rest of it. Um, they sold their Canadian uh, operation and they were sitting on uh, $4 billion of cash. So, you know, the, st the stock is undervalued because the stock would go up a lot if they implemented all these things, and, and uh, so why not buy back a lot of stock with that? Anyway, we, 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 we um, I called the CEO, Robert Edwards. We uh, met with him and, um, you know, took him through our ideas, and he basically said, you know what, these are all really good ideas, some of which we've already thought about. And I am open to anything as long as it's, you know, value creative. So I knew I had a kind of a partner and someone I could work with. And we had a very productive relationship, uh, you know, over m multiple months. And ultimately they decided, they got an offer from Cerberus, as you uh, mentioned, and sold the company. And, um, you know, it was very, it was not only financially rewarding, but it was, it was kind of personally rewarding because, you know, I got a phone call from the CEO uh, a couple weeks ago, and he said, I just want to tell you, you guys were terrific. You were really great investors. You really focused our attention on the right things. You guys were gentlemen, and you know what? You could use me as a reference for any, any, any investment you make. And was the catalyst for that the CEO, the CEO change in your... Yes, he was, was a new CEO, which is often a that's great, a, that's great a, juncture to get, get involved. It's a trick in the business, you know. To yeah, I mean, going. when we, when we get... Um, when we got involved with Juniper, there was a new uh, yeah. CEO. And, um, you know, we, we, we were pushing him to cut a lot of costs and uh, return capital and do a whole bunch of other things. And he, you know, this was a, 
a new CEO, and on his board were the three previous CEOs, all of whom had underperformed dramatically. And Great board. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? He, he, we got word later that he was actually very happy that we showed up because we gave him cover. Yeah, you did. make a lot of cover, changes right. that he couldn't have otherwise, he would have had difficulty from his board. Yeah, because so, the prior CEOs so didn't make bad. any mistakes. Yeah. Jeff, how about you? What's well, that, I mean, that, that whole idea of, you know, when I got into this business and we were doing board work in the initial days, I, I used to say there's like four roles we would play. We would get the, try to get the board and the management team off, off the 90-day clock. You know, you still have this idea that the CEO says, we're going to make 46 cents, and the room goes quiet, and some guy says, how is that compared to consensus? And then he says, it's a penny better, and they're like, well, let's go to lunch. You know, that, that actually still happens. But that, um, and, then, and, then, and then, you know, early days was make the balance sheet a value creator, because they don't think that way. And this idea of simplifying the business, making it more pure play, which can result in a sale of the whole company. So those are the, the, the four things um, in the early days. And then we've evolved to try to build these companies a little bit more. But this idea of working with a management team and giving them the courage to make hard decisions, you know, so we, when we went into Adobe, we said, get out of the upgrade cycle business into the SaaS model. And they said, well, that, that's really going to be painful. We're going to have to destroy our earnings. And we said, go for it. Go as, go as aggressively as you can. Rip the Band-Aid off. We're with you. Mm -hmm. And you know, we own 7% or 8% of the company. They were surprised right, that we would want to destroy the earnings stream for the long-term gain. And the same thing happened at Gartner Group, you know, where they, he wanted to move to the users rather away from the vendors with his research. And we had to build up a sales force kind of the expenses were ahead of the revenues, and we took our EBIT, EBITDA down, and we bought a lot of stock on the dip. And, um, and then seven years later, it's paying off in spades. So, so it's actually totally contrary to what people might expect in terms of in giving the management team the courage to make these hard, longer-term decisions. Yeah, it's really helpful. You know, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're somebody they can lean on. Yeah, if you're the largest shareholder, you're sitting on the board, uh, you know, we've, we've told, we've, I mean, we've got small cap companies who'll spend two days, you know, drafting their press release for their earnings, and, you know, I've got four people on the call. Hmm. And it's like, hey, why don't we focus on the business, let's simplify the press release, and, uh, and focus on the long term. And again, not, let's not focus on quarterly earnings, let's build the intrinsic value here. And, and, and it really gives them uh, a sense of confidence to do what's right as opposed to, to feel the pressure of, of being public. You brought up 8%, somebody else mentioned 4%. How much do you have to own to get management's attention? That's totally changed. That's the, that's the, that's the benefit of all this, of all this following uh, around the activist investors. The, um, uh, uh, T. Rowe Price was suspicious of us in the early days. I remember Catalina Marketing, we were selling the company a, as a board member, and they were like, you're going to you know, sell it out from underneath us too cheap or what have you. And, and now the, they're our biggest supporter. Uh, which is just a reflection of, of a long-term body of work where they know they can now trust us. And, and I think that's also true with Capri and with Fidelity. And this is probably a two or three year old phenomenon. And so now you can truly speak with, for 30% of the votes almost, you know, in a lot of situations with big companies and you, you, you can only own 1%, you know. Um, uh, and that is really enabling, and it lowers the risk in our business because historically I had to own 15% of the company to kind of get the right to get a board seat. Uh, that was how I did the business in the early days. That's not the case anymore. Cliff, how big are your positions on average? Yeah, so you know, we'll buy between 2 and 10% of the company. It, you know, there's no magic to that. We want to have a you know, significant stake because we want to make a ton of money if it works out. We want to have management's intention. In some companies, it's two or three percent. You know, in Akamai, Tribune, larger cap companies, we own two or three percent, and some of our three, four billion dollar market cap companies own eight to ten percent. You know, it's it's more about the risk reward of the investment and the liquidity in the name, and less about our needing to telegraph our influence through the size. So I think it's just you know just all those other factors come into play. But in that we're exclusively friendly, we're not trying to own more to get them to do more. If they're not going to partner with us and they're not going to unlock the value, we wouldn't invest irrespective of the scale of our, the, the size we could buy. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, although I do like to be, if possible, the largest shareholder or among the largest shareholders. 
I like them. I like to. I like. I like having the dynamic where they have to deal with us. They have to, you know, they can't, they can't have us, you know, be unhappy. And so, and, uh, um, but, uh, you know, you can, you can, today, you can, you can influence companies um, own, owning much smaller percentages because the long only community has become much more um, uh, supportive of these kinds of activities. So. You know, we, we, we just uh, bought a large position in Walgreens. That's a $70 billion company. You know, we own, I don't know, one and a half percent of it, um, or a little bit more than that. And, and yet with that, we've got their attention. And, um, Which is remarkable. I mean, that's, you're yeah. trying to act like private equity, but with 1% ownership. That shows you how diverse those positions and mm -hmm. the, the corporate holdings are. It's amazing. Yeah, well, what do you have to the do? same thing with uh, Microsoft. Yeah, similar. It's, it is amazing, actually. Well, now, so one of the things I was going to ask is when you, you're trying to control and get their attention with 1%, that means you've got to be out of uh, anything that's family-owned or yes. uh, a large net worth. You can still get Bill Gates' attention. Uh, well, Bill, so one of the reasons I hate this word, target, um, but one of the reasons it was a good target, and we don't think that way, was that Bill had sold down from 25 to four and a half, and the stock had been flat for 15 years, and you had these long-term institutional investors that saw the opportunity, were unwilling to sell, I understand that mentality, um, um, and would step into line if somebody would lead them. And, uh, and I think that I think, the, I think that model is replicable. You're probably, maybe you're doing it at Walgreens. Um, I think the danger uh, for me personally is, is sounding shrill, um, where you're just yelling, you're just going off, um, because you're really, really still only on 1%, right? And, um, and so I think uh, it, this will work best in situations where the target has had tremendous underperformance and has long-term big institutional shareholders that have a moral authority to talk to the board about the underperformance on our behalf. And I don't know how many situations there are like that out there in the big cap space. Uh, I, can't, I can't figure it out yet. The, the, what's interesting in the small cap space is we typically are the largest owner, but um, we'll have large institutions. So for instance, I'm on a couple boards where CalSTRS is an investor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we, we feel like we're acting on behalf of those large institutional uh, investors who don't necessarily have the, the resources to allocate time to that investment. And so uh, we do feel when there is more of a diversified, uh, large institutional ownership base, uh, we're not only working on their behalf, but it also being the largest investor uh, gives us the appropriate amount of influence so that we can affect change. Well, it's interesting you raise that. I got asked by Bloomberg TV today, that we weren't an activist investor, and I corrected and said, no, we are. We're just, with a 30-year horizon, we're just very passive, and I guess we're tough because we don't tweet and <laughs> do things in pub public. What about getting a corporate board seat? A couple of you think that's mandatory? Others disagree. Yeah, so uh, I'm probably an outlier here from Blue Harbor's standpoint. You know, I've been on 15 boards from big ones like Archer and Nabisco and ESPN to smaller companies, uh, but at Blue Harbor, we decided that we weren't going to take the board seats. You know, since we're only investing where we like the management team and we're only investing if we're aligned with them from the beginning and we want to maintain some level of liquidity and we don't want to have MNPI, uh, you know, we've decided not to take the board seats. We've been offered board seats in, let's say, two-thirds of our positions. If we think the company is weak, the board is weak, meaning we'll add a, one of our 50 former CEOs or a friend from industry, but we haven't put the Blue Harbor uh, uh, partners on the boards because our approach never is to change the management team or fix a broken company. Uh, and so that, our approach would be different than most activists who pretty much would like to have board seats in, in most situations. It's not been our model. It's the way we do it. Uh, and I think it works for us primarily because of our exclusively friendly approach. We, you guys we, disagree? We, well, um, no, I don't disagree. I, I, we, we actually try not to go on boards. We, we will go on them occasionally. Um, under the right circumstances, or we'll bring a, rep a representative, you know, uh, to serve as uh, someone watching out for our interests. But, you know, by and large, I don't want to be locked up. I don't want to lose liquidity. 
Um, and there's another factor, actually, that because the, oftentimes the changes that we're um, prosecuting are, have a, do have an immediate impact, I, there's no need for, for us to go on the board. The company's doing what we think needs, you know, needs to happen. And you know, I, I've, I've only gone on boards where, for a, de a defined period of time where I had an, you know, an agenda of things I wanted to accomplish, and once I accomplished them, I, I re you know, resigned from the board. You guys yeah, we're, see we're, it differently. I'm totally different. Yeah. You know, I, we, we start with the business, and, and uh, Buffett would say that, you know, you know, would you rather own a medi mediocre business with great management or, or a great business with mediocre management? And the answer is you always want to own the great business because it, that's what wins in the end. And so we're, we're always trying to find that great business that, 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 that even mediocre management cannot screw up. And so it's incumbent on us because um, the cash flows in good times and, and bad are what allow us to create value even on markdown situations because remember we're very long term. So it's incumbent on us um, um, to um, uh, change management essentially, uh, if that's what's required. And the way we get there is we get on the board uh, through the nominating committee, and we um, uh, don't come, uh, come into the first meeting guns blazing. We let the numbers speak for themselves, and we try to lead a fact-based decision-making process as one guy, and it's always a value act principle. So when we approach a company, we only want one seat, never a proxy slate, and it's the guy who knows the most, the most about your business from our firm, usually. Um, and uh, it's a low bar, and it's hard for the company to say no. And then we kind of lace it up and, and patiently work to make it better. Because you've got to get somebody to second your motion. If you're only one board seat, Doesn't tough. Never had a problem. Because, hmm. because you got all the information. Uh, we, we bring a lot of data with us as smart people around the company. And the room is full of guys that are, are willing to be led yeah. and make the tough decision even, but you gotta give them the information. You know, the problem with boards is the CEO is the filter to the board for all shareholders until you get a guy like us in the room. And, and it just changes the total dynamic. Yeah, I completely concur. We, uh, we currently have six board seats, five companies, all Red Mountain uh, principals. And it is amazing uh, how much influence you can garner in the context of just one board seat. If you have the right information, uh, if you can tell a compelling story, uh, if you have a long-term perspective, I, I completely agree that, especially in the small cap space where there's uh, kind of a less experienced public company board that you're interacting with, they're looking to be led uh, and they're open um, uh, to, to good suggestions. And so... Now, we would love to have your business where everything just works, and we are, we are basically owning a value stock that, that does two times our money in three years, and that happens sometimes. It happens mm -hmm. enough, but, um, but, but half the time, it turns out, there's a role for us to play. It defines itself over time, though. It doesn't define it immediately up front with some sort of letter or what have you. I, just one other point in terms of the board. We take a little bit of a different approach in terms of, you know, we're, we're trying to establish trust and credibility with the management team. So we're, we've, in every situation, we've, we've been invited. You know, sometimes we've asked to be invited. Uh, but um, it's our view that, you know, over the course of six to 12 months, you've got to build that relationship, and then you can have that conversation about the board seat once you've kind of proven your worth, if you will. I'm curious when you guys engage a company. You're saying that you're coming in with some ideas on how Long-term solutions are going to hurt quarterly earnings. How often do the CEOs already have thought of that themselves? They're just afraid to hurt quarterly earnings. You, you know, you're, you're pushing a ball down a hill in that case, and you, you're just giving them the courage to act. Um, and there's a good amount of that. I think Barry's good at that. You know, your targets. You got these guys that that have thought about some of these things that you're bringing to them and you give it a push. Pushing out an open door. Push, yeah. And that, that's, um, that is working. Mm -hmm. It's working, uh, you know, we do less of that. It's always great when you can convince the management team that the idea was their idea. I mean, that is always a win for the activists and for the management team. And there's a sales cycle to this. Even though I'm telling you we're friendly only, 
No CEO ever went home to his or her spouse after the first meeting with us and said, honey, the most wonderful thing happened today. <laughs> These guys from Connecticut tell, came to tell me how to unlock value in our company. You know, you have, you know, we don't come in the first meeting tell them a lot, a lot of ideas. We're listening. And in the second meeting, we're showing some analysis. In the third meeting, we're talking to the lead director. And then we're back to the CEO. And we're trying to convince the management team that our ideas make sense. And if we could get them to take them on as their own idea, that's fabulous. The difference is, if we can't make that sale, if we're convinced they're not going to unlock the value, if we don't think they're very good at what they do, and we don't respect them as managers, we're not going to pursue it. Just call me. And then we'll call Barry. But, 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 but there's definitely a sales cycle, and it's a win-win for all the activists uh, if we can get management to take ownership in, in the idea. And, we, want, and, we, and we, we applaud that, and we give them the credit when, uh, when the value is unlocked. You know, all we want to do is make money for our clients. We're not looking, trying to put skins on the, on, on the wall. The, re so. the reason management change is so powerful, whether we do it you know, after you've been in the company for a while or you invest around management change, is you sync up with this new manager on a plan that may be your plan, but it becomes his. And then, and then, and then, and then the, the really powerful dynamic is to put in place a comp plan That's right. that feeds that strategy and causes them to run as fast as possible after it. And, um, and then, you got, then, you're, then, you, then you can just sit back and say, go, man. Yeah, one of the things we've actually done is, um, as opposed to you know, switching out the CEO, which is a risk in and of itself, is we've incorporated an executive chairman, maybe someone with larger company experience, uh, more strategic vision, more uh, can, be, can act as a mentor. And they'll spend 50% of their time kind of ensuring that you know, the, the strategy that has been set out by the board is being effectively executed. And the CEO still has you know, all the responsibilities that, that, that he had, but uh, he has someone to kind of work with him and through that, uh, that change. When you, when you talk about credit, uh, it reminds me of a, a, a deal I was involved with a couple years ago for Marathon Oil, Mar and, or Marathon Petroleum, which was a spinoff of Marathon Oil. Had two businesses, um, uh, basically a, a refining business, low multiple refining business, and a higher multiple um, uh, pipeline, midstream pipeline business. And um, the company, the, I mean, the logical thing was for the company to split the business up because one, one would trade, the whole company was trading at the lower multiple. And um, so, and this, like two weeks before we showed up, the CEO went public and uh, at a conference and said, no interest in splitting this company up. Doesn't make any sense, not going to do it. So then we, bought 6% of the company, and I called them before, and we filed a notice of proxy, but it, it wasn't public yet. And I, and I said, you know, when I called them and I introduced myself to him, and uh, he said, um, I'd like to fly in and see you tomorrow. And uh, of course, and so he came in, and um, we laid out all the reasons, you know, took him through the quantitative analysis, you know, showing him why this made sense. And when we were all finished with it, he, um, he said, I just have one question. And I said, what's that? And he said, who's going to get credit for this? And I said, you can get credit. I don't care. <laughs> and I said, in fact, we'll draft a press, you know, we could draft a point joint press release and I'll, we'll laud that you, this was your idea, which we did. And um, so, you know, he immediately did a 180 and um, I was happy to let him take credit. Oh, but you, you, you could have stayed, stayed out of the press release altogether. What? You could have stayed out of the press release No, he wanted altogether. us in the press release. Okay. Surprising. Yeah. So talk to us about that big stick. You said you like to, you have to whack them every once in a while. You have to get their attention. What is that I, like? You know, look, I, look I, I, have, I know I have a different philosophy than, than these guys, but I happen to believe that, um, you know, as Cliff was, was uh, describing, the, no, no CEO is happy when we show up. Right? None of them say, oh, thank God you're here. You've got with good ideas. I mean, by definition... That we never thought of. Yeah, by definition, it's a repudiation of. of what they've been doing. Right? You're, you're having the company go in a different direction. And so... Um, uh, but I happen to believe that um, the only reason why they listen to us, the only reason is because they don't want to face a proxy fight because they know they're going to lose. And... Um, uh, and I, I, you know, in my experience at least, and maybe I'm less persuasive than these guys, but if, if, I'm, if they know I'm not willing to go all the way, they'll push, push you as far as you're willing to go, and then you're stuck. And um, so I, 
you know, I happen to think having that stick goes a long way toward getting these companies to just go do what we want them to do without any fight. And we, we, we really don't get fights anymore at all. I think that's a critical point. You've got to be willing to go all the way. And, and, and we would never uh, uh, shy away from a proxy content, contest in the, uh, in the right context. But, um, uh, but we do certainly try to, to take a more constructive approach, which has worked uh, to this point. But if you don't have that stick, um, you, 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 in effect, are uh, uh, doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, but at the we're, same time, these two guys have done a no, good no, job. No, no, but you're, without, you're without, you know, uh, this, is, this is probably, it's good for me to jump in here because um, we uh, have to go to that kill zone every time almost too. You what? Have to go to that, that kill zone, that proxy notice period as well. Um, typically, we uh, we're, nom we're interviewing with the nominating committee, and so we're trying to um, to not have to end in some sort of uh, midnight affair. But you know, the problem is management's fill all available time. You know, thinking maybe we're not going to do this, or we'll back off, or what have you. Right. And so, um, as friendly as we look, it's there's still this. You know, I'm not crazy you're here, and I know my job is much more at risk than if you weren't in the room. And so, but because we're asking for one seat, and because we've been there for a while, and the directors know us, because we always go visit the directors kind of early in our ownership, um, we, get, we always get there. But I tell you, it's much more hairy than, than, and I really don't want to do a proxy contest. Just the idea of going negative on the board uh, has a totally different dynamic than when you get in that room having done a deal with them. Um, so they, they probably don't know that I don't want to go to a proxy contest as much as I don't want to go to a proxy contest. And if they did, they might call my bluff, well, but they you know, don't. This is open to the public. I don't know if you want to let, them, let everybody know that. Yeah, right. But, but to Barry's point, we're always going to win because, you know, in our case, we have a reputation and we also are only asking for one seat, typically. So they know that. So, how, Chris, how does your conversation go? You're walking in to a, CF, a CEO of a small company. Yep. You're saying, hi, I'm here to help you because you've done a crappy job running the company. No, it, we think you're COO material at best. We, we, <laughs> we, but I really like I, you, and I hope I, this is your idea. I often call the, uh, the CEOs of the companies that we, we invest in sometimes, and it's kind of the, uh, the coffee maker and the rainmaker. You know, he does everything. Um, but it, 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 back to my earlier point, it takes time. We feel we have to build trust and credibility. So you first got to go in and listen. If we're not as, so presumptuous to go in and think that we know as much about the company as the CEO does. Yeah. So first we want to hear about how they think about capital yeah. allocation, yeah. how they think about strategy. And then as we, then we enter into a dialogue, we're establishing credibility, we're establishing some trust, and then it's much easier to start uh, giving suggestions and start to have those conversations um, about board uh, directorship and, and other more difficult uh, conversations, which we would never have at the outset. Yeah. Now, what about capital allocation? I mean, that's critical and oftentimes a huge area for, of mistakes for CEOs. But nowadays, many want to sit on large amounts of cash because of the, just the risks that are inherent in their industry. Do you want to come into those situations and say, unload the cash, or, or would you rather, are you okay with holding some a safety net? I mean, it depends so much on the situation and on the industry. I mean, I think that, you know, certainly you're, it's absolutely correct that there are a lot of inefficient balance sheets out there, and a lot of companies, after the financial crisis, raised debt and raised equity, and they stopped doing CapEx, and cash balances ballooned, and, and rates have collapsed. So there's certainly a lot of inefficient balance sheets out there. But the prescription you know, for every company is different. And there are companies that need to keep that cash because their business, as you said, is, in, is risky, or they're in cyclical businesses, or they, they need to invest in R&D. There are other companies that, whose stock is trading at a significant discount to an intrinsic value, and they ought to buy back their stock. There are some companies that should make synergistic acquisitions. There are some companies that just should return in, uh, to, do, to amend their dividend policy. So I think, it's, I think that there, there is an, uh, it's a great question because there is a perception out there that activists want companies to buy back all the stock. Uh, and I think that you know, buying back stock only makes sense if a company is trading at a big discount to intrinsic value and management has confidence in the future of that company. Then that, that, that buy, buying back of shares could be a really high return. Right. But and there are many situations where buying back stock 
does not make any sense at all, i.e., if the stock is not undervalued or if there's a better use, a higher return right. use. That's what I was going to say. I do think that um, there is a cyclical aspect to this where, and you saw it in 07, where the hedge funds say, you know, if you just ignored my shorts and looked at my longs, you know, I would be really good and then uh, pay me a performance fee because I'm an activist now. And uh, those guys are one-trick ponies, you know, give me the cash back. Uh, and and, and I, I actually think that um, um, specific, most recently, it's really misguided to give all your cash back in a share repurchase when M&A has been incredibly accretive to the acquire war. So head down, give me your cash back, shorten the duration of an equity because, you know, I'm playing short-term fear game um, and I want my money back, which is my activist play, has been wrong because we've created tremendous value with M&A. Um, and, and the numbers are staggering. The, the premium that's accruing to the acquire or stock price is plus 6%. Yeah, we, on, the, on the day of the announcement. That's a, I mean, we're, we're, the first thing we're looking for is can we find a company that can actually reinvest its capital in excess of its cost of capital as opposed to returning to shareholders. Now, to Cliff's point, there's certainly a, a point in time in a company's life cycle where uh, that makes sense in terms of how to allocate capital. But out of the gate, we're looking for those good companies that actually have a position within an industry and a business model where they can actually reinvest their capital back into their business. Let me ask you guys this. It's an open session, so we can talk to Carl Icahn and Bill Ackman and, and Dan Loeb. What would you say to them? Keep it up? Keep stirring the pot? Keep making noise? Or would you say, knock it off, you're making it tougher, or you're going to make the environment more difficult in the future? I, I think it doesn't matter. First of all, I'm, I, all th they're, real, I'm, they're I'm, irrelevant. They're I'm just close friends with, with Dan and Carl, and I'm friendly with Bill. I think they're all extremely intelligent and talented and um, they do their thing and we do our thing and I, I, and I uh, companies distinguish among us they, they know you know they, they all hire the same investment banks and lawyers lawyers who you know advise them here's the reputation of this these people and so I, I, I kind of think they're they're it's kind of irrelevant I don't think they have any impact on on, on my business you know I think um, I agree with you I think the uh, this there's a role. This isn't. I think this um, makes a ton of sense as an asset class. I uh, I think when Marty Lipton put in place the poison pill and the staggered board in the 90s, companies were no longer subject to the to the hostile bid. You know, and corporate con in losing corporate control, and that created tremendous passivity that has only been countered over the last 10 or 15 years by guys like us. Um, uh, and and uh, I think what's going to happen, much like private equity. Is this, as, this, as this asset class institutionalizes, you will, you will have brands that come through with certain modus operandi, and, and, and that's fine, you know? Um, I think it was, it was harder three years ago when I was lumped in with these guys, and, I, and, and I'm like, I'm not one of them, you know? I mean, I'm not a pushover, but I'm not one of them. Uh, I think now, as it institutionalizes in different flavors, uh, uh, are, are, are coming to the market, then it's going to get easier to distinguish between us, and it, we just do it differently. Chris, what do you think? No, I, I, I completely, look, we're, we're first and foremost big fans of activism, and we define activism as uh, can you enhance value through change, uh, long-term intrinsic value. And I think both of them have uh, proven themselves to be both great investors uh, and in many instances have uh, done uh, very well for the shareholders. and. Um, uh, but with that said, we believe that a constructive view is, is uh, it, it re reflects uh, the environment in which we work and with these small cap companies and is also a reflection of our skill set. So you think they're both very uh, bright and very intelligent. What about Herbalife? Is that a pyramid scheme? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, actually, you know, the, when I set up John Partners, um, the very first activist investment I made was in Herbalife. And I, and I pushed them to sell, to go To go private. long, not I, short. I, no, I went long, and I pushed them to go private. They went to... Uh, and that company got underwritten by a really smart private equity firm yeah, using Gold, debt. Golden Gate and... Uh, so Wade. that's difficult yep. to say that that business is not a real business. Yeah. 
It certainly has gotten a lot of attention. Final comments. Let's start with Cliff and then move on down. Uh, I think that uh, activism is going to, over the next three to four years, be even you know, bigger than it is today. It's a high return strategy, and what's driving that is the sea change in corporate governance. You just can have influence, uh, and really you have influence and pay market prices for it. Back when I was in the private equity business, you had to pay a 30 to 50 percent premium to buy the whole company to affect change. And in the investment business, which you pay for something such a prime return of your return, we're able to buy enough of the company to affect the change and pay no premium. So it's going to continue to be a high return strategy. And uh, it comes in different flavors. And different personalities are involved in it. And people do it in different ways. Uh, but I, I think it's a really good thing for corporate governance that it's here. Uh, and I think it's here to stay. No, I, um, I agree. And. Um I think that uh, the distinction between the corporate raiders, among which I was in the 80s, and the activists today are, in the, a raider wanted to buy the company and keep all the economics for himself. An activist improves the, the, the value of, uh, of the company on behalf of all the shareholders because they only own a minority stake. So that's got to be a good development. And I think the um, uh, institutionalization of it is, is here to stay. I think you've, the fact that you've got the long only institutional community supporting it is, um, is evidence of that. And um, I do think that you know, activism is maybe is overdone a little bit. And, and you know, it's like the flavor of the year. And, um, and everybody wants to be an activist, and everybody wants to invest in activists. And I personally don't think there's enough good activist candidates to support 150. Good activists, act investors, or, or companies? Companies. Um, and um, I mean, I, you know, we're not solely an activist investor. I, we, we just we invest as an activist only if and when all the, our criteria are met. Otherwise, I'm happy to invest in, you know, just good adventure in situations. So. Um, I, think, I think you're going to see a bifurcation of the activist community. I think you're going to see, you know, the people, uh, you know, on the stage here and, and a few others who get larger and, and you know, uh, will continue to be effective. I think you're going to see, all, I, I saw this, I've seen these cycles now over all these years many times. I think you're going to start to see some shakeout um, uh, among some of the, uh, you know, smaller activists. Chris? Our view is there's 31 flavors of activism, uh, and uh, it's not necessarily, you know, every strategy or most strategies have proven to work in one form or another, and uh, it's not about good or bad, it's whether or not the activist actually has demonstrated an ability to enhance long-term intrinsic value, and that's what activism is. You know, I'm, I'm the curmudgeon in the room. I, I, I... I see, I see evidence of green mail. It's inside green mail. I've seen three activists sell their shares at the last tick back to the company in a privileged seat as a board member. And um, those are the only three that come to mind. I can, they come to mind pretty quickly. So, so uh, uh, I say you better, we better be careful we don't kill the golden goose. Um, I think the media has to call out some of this stuff that, uh, and not just celebrate quote unquote, the victories of activist investors. Um, and companies might want to push back a little bit more because there, there, there is some bad behavior going on. And that bad behavior is going to be bad for all of us investors. Could be. And I think you know, the, the idea of green mail uh, flashes back um, a fear because we I ran a pension plan in the 80s and that's really what started corporate governance from our standpoint and our activism so hopefully for the pension plans in the room you'll start to get more active I think we should be activist investors because we're going to own these companies for 30 years please join me in well and thanking all of these gentlemen for their comments <laughs>